Welcome to this evening's episode of Beers and Bites, sponsored by your co-hosts, Chris Jordan of Fluency and Jeremy Mershaw of Fortify 24-7. And with us tonight, we have a very, very special guest. He's the illustrious, the enigmatic Dave Mayberry. Now, you guys get to figure out who he is and what he does, but in normal life, he probably is the VP of Business Development and Risk at Verify. So with that, welcome, Dave. We're excited about what you're going to share with us this evening. And with that, Chris, why don't you go ahead and start us off with what beer you have? So, so I'm trying to decide which one to start with. I got, I got a couple dogfish here. I got the dogfish head. I got the, um, their mighty, something is slightly, slightly mighty. Um, it's one of these low, the guys got me on this little carb thing. Yeah. Oh, you got one too? So there we go. That's, oh, this is a local beer for us. And I, you know what? I just was joking with Dave. I said, really, this is just beer flavored water at 4%. So I turned around and got their other version here, the, the, the Liquid Truth Serum IPA, which is a, still a little light. It's a seven IPA, so it's not close to a double, it's a point short of a double. But, you know, they did, they do in the hazy and they do the hazy right. So they're basically what they do is they do a sprinkle of hops, dry hops during the boiling process. And that gets the hazy in there. Some people cheat and put flour in it. Uh, these guys are pretty straight up and they made sure they knew that they weren't cheating. So maybe kind of like how you might co uh, cook coffee beans shorter or longer to get different flavors and stuff. You, or, or when they're really crappy beans, you cook the crap out of them until they're really dark and then you then you call it Starbucks. Yeah. All yeah, right, yeah. Jeremy. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so with that, Jeremy, what do you got? Well, the, for the first time in Beers and Bites history, we have two people with the same beer on separate coasts. So awesome. Dogfish Head has made its way to the east side of the country. So, yep, we're going to try that. And then keeping with the, uh, the low-calorie IPA, we've got the Golden Road, has made a uh, local LA brewery here and made the Skinny IPA. 99 calories, almost no alcohol, flavored dude, water. So, dude, what happened to the big 24-ounce cans and stuff? I mean, what's going on here? Oh, crap. They, always, that they, always, they only sell the skinny crap in small cans. That's how they lower the calories. Anyway, oh, yeah. Is that what it is? <laughs> All right. So, Dave, what did you bring this evening, sir? No, I'm, I'm now on this lower calories thing. I think the Girl Scouts have shrunk their cookie containers, and I'm fairly bitter about it. <laughs> uh, I am drinking. A beer called the Rusty Kilt Pin from a brewery called the Angry Scotsman in Oklahoma City. It is a staple beer from the homeland. Highly drinkable Scottish style malt red brown ale. Wow. It's lighter yet wee heavy. And then I've got a 405 experimental India pale ale called Vocal Fry, which is brewed with experimental hops and a reimagined yeast strain. So there you if go. I grow up tomorrow with a uh, third eye, you'll know where it came from. Well, I, I was almost thinking you might have to <laughs> grow some hair and then shave it or something, you know. But... I, I just love how he parts his scalp. <laughs> I got Jeremy teasing, teasing me with a mullet. You know, you know how long I've dreamed of having a mullet that had the business in the front part? There All you go. Long, I got party in the back. <laughs> the business in the front, it's lost cost. <laughs> All right. Well, this evening I've got my standby Alaska IPA. Uh, it is a low IPA, but listen, you can't beat that glacier water when you're making that beer. Right. So there's something to that. Anyway, have, so with have that, you ever finished one of these beers? The I show? have. It, it takes me about a show and I drink a beer. I, I realize you guys are more interested in drinking than asking questions, but every now and then I do love to ask questions of our guests. <laughs> well, this will be interesting because now Chris and I will be able to uh, give our own opinion, our individual opinions of the same beer for once. So there you cheers, go. boys. Cheers. And you can't buy cheers. a six pack of this either. They, 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 they make you buy a 12 pack. So if this first one sucks, you keep having to go. All right. So with that, guys, Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and stuff? I know today's meeting, and we're going to focus more on risk. That sounds like an awfully big subject to talk about. Yeah, it is. It's a giant subject to talk about. <laughs> and uh, in, in a lot of ways, I, I always refer back to a 
Jordan's comment on Bruce Schneier and, uh, you know, complexity is the, uh, the friend of security kind of model <laughs> and, and uh, risk is something that I think we've done a, a pretty bang up job of making incredibly complicated and difficult to follow. Uh, my background uh, came out of healthcare operations, joined a uh, big four firm, became a partner there, uh, was responsible for enterprise risk services uh, as part of my role, and uh, then was recruited to industry to be a chief risk officer for a financial service company, which is where I, uh, I kind of found out where the rubber meets the road in terms of theory versus practicality and application. And that's actually where I met Chris. Uh, I was I was one of their first clients, and uh, and the the way it wasn't I like your club of men, I'll tell you that. Do what? <laughs> it wasn't the hair club of men. <laughs> no, no, I got you and you and Quinn lording over me with your flowing locks. Very bitter about that still. Um, but but what what really drove me to to fluency and and Chris and Quinn was this idea of risk has to be articulated from the perspective of your organization. What I mean by that is I can show you five banks. They're all going to have different risk profiles depending on their customer base, depending on the technology they use, depending on a lot of different factors. And in a lot of ways, the approach to risk has really bifurcated in multiple directions where in, in some organizations, you'll have a technology risk function, security risk function, an operational risk function, an actuarial risk function, and there's nothing really tying those together and helping the organization articulate risk, especially around technology these days. Uh, it, it's really become kind of a, a paper chase in terms of, you know, you need to show a certain amount of activity, but the practicality, the output may not be seen by the greater organization. Right, now it, it's interesting, <clears throat> just recently, uh, news broke of a top cyber insurance insurer being hacked. And I, I suppose I can say their name, CNA. So if you're sitting on the board and you have responsibility for cyber, secu uh, cyber security risk management, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to offset my spend on actual solutions, and I'm going to take the path of least resistance and maybe lower cost initially and go with insurance. Well, guess what? Even those guys get hacked, right? And, and really, at the end of the day, when you go back to when Trump was in office, he signed into law a piece of, of, of code that allowed insurance companies to declare at a greater rate that it was a state actor that was doing it and therefore an act of war, and therefore we don't have to pay out. So when we look at risk, talk a little bit about that in terms of how do you balance that scale then in terms of cybersecurity? Well, I think part of it is is really, and I mean, this is this is old hat, but making cybersecurity integral to the organization. You know, in a lot of cases, the cybersecurity people are the calls that people dial up when they can't get on a Zoom call, when their email doesn't work and they blame it on the firewall or the password that they've used the last 18 years doesn't work. All of those things create chains of risk throughout the organization and, and being able to connect those chains in relation to their business. So in that case, they probably have a K or in an insurance company standpoint, they're, they're filing an ORSA report. And if that report failed to articulate that risk in a way that the board had oversight, that's a pretty drastic failure of, of risk or, or they made the risk so complex that a board member really wasn't able to understand it. And so I think in both of those cases, you get back to this idea of what's your core business and how does risk across all these factors, security, technology, operations, influence how you make decisions as an organization and, and ultimately decide where you're gonna spend money. You may not wanna spend money in this area, but at least be aware of it and be able to articulate. Yeah, and one other one other point, uh, Deloitte recently came out with a report that really talked about this concept of the iceberg, right? On the yeah. tip of the iceberg, you see the public stuff, but on the bottom of the iceberg, the costs are, are, are not even twofold, threefold, but upwards of sixfold, because now you're talking reputation of the company, the cost of borrowing, right? And all of these other things that companies don't consider 
uh, when they look at risk, right, in, in terms of applying solutions and stuff. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great point. And, and really, I think what we've seen over the last decade to 15 years is, you know, the core of, of most companies is their customer base and how they manage that identity and how people are able to manage that identity. And, you know, now with uh, the CCPA legislation passing in California, I think Virginia just passed recent privacy acts. There's, there's a little bit more of a, of a toothed uh, adversary with regards to how the individual now is gonna come back into focus for an organization. And I think, I think ultimately when you look at risk, there's value in your customer base having a single identity. And, and if you, especially in the case of insurance, um, and I think we've seen this uh, really with, with a lot of the fraud that's occurred with the PPE funding and the, uh, the bailout packages. I think the last thing I saw was 63 billion in fraudulent claims. Um, if the system's that fragmented and broken and, and we're unable to detect or even respond to that other than pushing that back down to the consumer, um, it, it's time to look at risk in, in a different way. And these are the type of issues that just continue to exacerbate. Um, it, it, it's, it's a challenge because in a lot of ways it shouldn't be as costly. It shouldn't be as complex. And I don't you know, want to should on myself here, but it's, it is one of those things that if you think about it, logically, there's been a need to upgrade how we look at controls and risk related to security. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of that's been informed by Sarbanes-Oxley, by rules like ORSA, and people focus on the output as opposed to the real meaning for the organization. That was probably a long-winded way of not answering the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly a lot of consideration. So Jeremy or Chris, any thoughts there? Yeah, yeah so let's take a step back, Dave, because I think most yeah. people who listen to our show know that Jeremy and I are very geekish and, and Al is very much on the threat format. He loves to talk about threat, but I think one of the things that's striking me early in this conversation, and one thing that you've always harped on, and one reason why I like you so much, is you have a completely different view of security than, than Jeremy and I do, because you look at risk, not security. And that's a significant difference. And, and if people have been listening to just for the first five minutes you speak, you're dropping regulations and requirements, right? And, and that's a big difference is that when you talk security, you're talking governance. So can you go in there and talk about the difference between governance versus security operations? Yeah, that's a really, I think, key point is, is and, and most organizations that I'm familiar with skip over it, which is, is that model where everybody wants to jump to the new bright and shiny toy. Yeah, what does this do? Uh, Splunk is a good example of that. What? How are how are you looking at your risk? Oh, we got Splunk. We're we're compiling a massive amount of data that we can't really deal with, so we're just going to let it sit there and fester until we get a deposition, and then it'll blow up on us. And that's I I think Chris that complexity has just grown. I guess well, back it up a second. Like it seems to me, just being in, in a in an age group, that I feel like when Bluetooth came out and their public, you know, they 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 got whacked in terms of their public offering because of the inherent uh, vulnerabilities that were in relate. That was sort of I think it was like ninety seven, ninety six. That was kind of the peak in my mind <laughs> of security awareness. Everybody really understood it. It was relatively simple. And then we've added controls and other controls and other organizations and competing organizations. I was actually on a standards call today for an organization I won't mention. And if you're familiar with Monty Python, it, it was like going to a people's front of Judea meeting where you know, we were debating the, the definition of is. And I think that's it. It's easy to dive into the complexity of this. And as geeky types, we like the complexity, but there's a real need to simplify to a certain degree of, of how is this risk manifesting itself 
both internally to your organization and also externally to your customers. And the internal to your organization could be as simple as protections of IP, just things you don't think about. And they're difficult now to elevate. That risk is really hard to elevate because the first thing you're gonna get asked is what standard are you using? Are you using NIST? Are you using ISO? Which parts are you looking at? And, and people tend to wanna to respond to that and say, yeah, I've got NIST. What's NIST doing? What are the key controls within risk? And that's where I think this idea of security is a behavioral issue now. It's, it's shifted from being, there is a technical component to it, but mm -hmm. there's also, I think, a, a larger component, which gets down to the risk is really the behavior and how the organization behaves in relation to these emerging threats. And, and understanding that and being able to talk about that across all three, and I'll use the terms lines of business, just as those get kind of bandied around now, especially in financial services, those are key buzz terms. And that your front end security people probably know a hell of a lot more about risk than you're giving them credit for in the business. And somehow that translation in a lot of cases gets lost between your security reporting and monitoring and response and what the board is seeing and hearing in relation to how these security risks risk are managing the, comp the, comp the company. And frankly, right now, the complexity that most organizations have in place around these type of issues makes it very difficult to translate because the language is so overcomplicated. So you, you, you're hitting, I, I still remember one of the spreadsheets from PwC that we went through and it had like 900 different requirements all over the place, right? Uh, questions to ask somebody. And really you bring up an interesting point, right? Understanding a holistic security model versus understanding a bunch of requirements for shiny new toys, right? Yes. And, and, and this overall vision you brought up behavior and, and Jeremy and I, we love behavior, right? We, we see, listen, you can't detect anything on Office 365. You can't patch it. You can't- Exactly. Virus. The only thing you're gonna know if, if somebody's compromised is behavior. Behavior is the future. Yeah. We, we were all in on it, but how do you add governance to behavior? That's where I think you've got to go back and start thinking about what's really important to you from a security standpoint. I mean, if you just start, let's just take security as an example. Where does security typically break down? And you've got to kind of think of that in terms of, is it, is it monitoring? Is it incoming traffic? Is it outgoing traffic? Is it your change control process? Is it your development process? One point you always bring up, which I think is brilliant, did you just move all your security problems out of a data center into the cloud where I think your line was, you know, you can't patch the cloud. So, yeah. you, you, you know, this this kind of wholesale, it's it's not well, whack-a-mole. Dave, but it, Dave but, it's a bumper sticker. It's not the cloud of someone else's computer. It's the cloud is now somebody else's problem, right? In other yes. words, you're giving your problems to the cloud. Right. Yeah, and that's, that's a really good point, because in what I think what we've seen in a lot of organizations and and part of this was, you know, the consulting kind of one on one model outsource your non core business. You know, you need to have some you can have somebody do your HR, you can have somebody do your technology, you can have these these back office functions become managed by third parties. And a lot of cases, those third parties are pushing management to a fourth party. How do you really get an understanding of that? And, and it's difficult to do that when you're having to dig through thousands of controls that may or may not flow across the organization in a consistent manner. Yeah, and I, I, I want to I pick up on that one piece real quick on the third party, because more and more and more, we're hearing about the third party suppliers being the point of breach, right? Or infection, if you will. And yep. in the... The problem is, is, if you're trying to get your own house together with the risk management, are you going to extend an arm and demand and require that your suppliers have this? Or are you going to actually be able to check it and verify it? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly the point, Al. You know, in a lot of cases, uh, third parties have auditability clauses. You have the right to audit, but that right to audit probably involves calling, scheduling a time you're going to show up 
everybody goes out to dinner, has a good time, goes see a couple of sporting events, you go back, your third party risk box has been checked, but you still don't really know what you've inherited. And that's, I think the supply chain is the best example now because we've just seen it break down at such a level that this, this idea of on demand uh, inventory it, 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 there, there may be a practicality aspect to that that we're uh, we're not fully seeing, and I think that so go back as a to business, the yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you said it. Uh, uh, well, I mean, the other the other thing too is look 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 at the blame, right? Transfer the blame off of me to some supplemental that we hired who put a password that wasn't right. Well, so, so stop right there because because I really wanted Germany to jump in, but now you got a point here. So Dave, in your knowledge of it, just because you gave it to a third party to manage, you're still liable. Yeah, you can't okay. outsource yeah. management's responsibility. You absolutely can't. And, and I think to some degree, a lot of this has been turned into a very legal argument out to that point. How can, I push, how can I push blame off? How can I, oh, it's a hostile act. I don't have to pay this or... I, I can switch vendors if my background check operation isn't working the way I see it. And, and these, these holes have just been fractured by the pandemic. You know, the pandemic kind of pushed everything up by, what, 10 years, five years over where yeah. the predictions were going for 2030. It's like, well, we're, we're here. And unfortunately, when you outsource parts of your business, you're out, it's still your name. It's still your organization and how, how you deal with that. Um, ultimately, to one of the first points you made, Al, it gets back to trust and gets back to how your, uh, your clients consider uh, your integrity of your organization. Right. Guest <laughs> appearance. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too far, Jeremy, you know, one thing, one thing Dave was talking about was like, that was that Paris, place. by the way. <laughs> How are things spread out? And um, so one of the questions I really wanted to bring Jeremy in is, so Jeremy, you're dealing with customer data all the time. And we see you're pulling in O365, you're pulling in Zoom and all. So are you seeing this issue that Dave's talking about, the, the governance issue? Like, do first of all, do clients really see that? And then how do you help clients? <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. The of a lot of most of our clients do not have did not put us as an organization through that background check that Dave was alluding to. Yeah, right. They didn't. They just said, "Okay, we'll 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 trust, but not verify that you are capable of doing your job and that you have the proper security controls in place to make sure that my data is safe." Um, which is fine. However, it, it, it does for less reputable or, or, or different organizations, you're putting yourself at risk. But there's a different risk here in the supply chain than just not being able to get toilet paper. Even as organizations, all of us as organizations here on this call require the use of, of software that somebody else has developed. And if someone, like we've seen with the SolarWinds hack and we've seen with the Acelion hack, right? When someone else is poisoning the upstream systems, that's an, a whole level, another level of risk that was never contemplated going into, into this, this either outsourced IT or everyone believes that the manufacturer of the software is doing their best to make sure that their software is safe. Now all of a sudden, here we are, SolarWinds hack, now all the US government agencies have been hacked, a bunch of other organizations have been hacked, Exchange hack, Hathium, right? Well, now, we, now we've exposed even more data. And then we've got the Excellion hack, right? And that's even bigger than anybody wants to like actually admit or, or contemplate, right? So it's risk is huge in this new world. As we become more dependent on technology, to do our jobs to support our business, risk is broader than just um, KYC, right? And KYB. It's now you need whether we need one for know your vendor, KYV or whatever we're going to call it, right? 
So we ha we all have to do those those checks to make sure that our the, the companies that we're working with are are doing the things that they need to to make sure that their product is protected. I but, totally you know we're going to throw we're throwing about we're throwing about around acronyms. So as we're talking about identity and identity verification, Dave, what's what is KYC? What is KYB? What is AML? What do these things mean? Know listeners. your customer, know your business, know your business. So who are you transacting with? There's investor verification. Who do you know where the money's coming from? How do you know that the money is legitimate? So pre-qualifying investors uh, for organization. I think there's there's become a know your student angle around this. You know, as you see more schools begin to push these different angles around know your student and and these are all basically regulations that have fallen into line because of abuse system abuses let's say just systematic abuses of you know synthetic identity funding organizations that you probably shouldn't be funding uh, you don't want it at least public that you're funding them um that that level of knowledge and transparency between individuals and businesses and organizations uh has been kind of lost you know, your identity now is like you could have a different identity on Twitter. You could have a different LLC set up that you're running everything through that is easy to validate. But as long as nobody shows up and sees that it's a P.O. box and and a web address, there, there are just so many different ways to spoof the system now. It's it's I mean, in a lot of ways, I, I term the practice kind of, you know, we farm people. Now we farm people's data, we take the data, we reuse it, we reproduce it, we repackage it, we go through all these efforts. And the same thing's done with organizations as well. And we've got to kind of get back, we've, we've got to think about getting back to a way of saying, how do we assess the risk of engaging with this person? And, you know, with identity, it could be as simple as liveness test. How are you validating that this is a real human being on the other end of the phone? How are you validating the credentials? I, I mean, my my favorite pet, pet peeve in the world right now are the the proliferation of MIT and Harvard graduates on LinkedIn, because anybody, you know, you go to a two week course at MIT and executive, and all of a sudden you're an MIT graduate. I, one that devalues the hell out of that degree, <laughs> but but two, just just something as simple as validating identity and education and and credentials has become almost impossible unless you're validating at the source Who, who's the credentialing agency who's the licensing agency that's delivering the license where's the llc formed are you going directly to that source all of these things combine to create a more accurate picture of who people are but in most cases there, there's no real incentive to do that yet so it's like you've got to do a more comprehensive background check than what the typical background check is going to do, right? They're going to tick yeah. the boxes, right? But it's really about getting into like the OSINT world and diving into the actual person and the actual things, right? Running a Multigo transform to try to figure yeah. out if you can find all the linkages between all these different places, right? And see, okay. Where's the overlap? Where you know, and 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 come up with a real profile about the person or the business that you're working with. Well, I yeah, mean, and there. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead Dave. Sorry. Go ahead, Dave. I was I was just going to say I, I think Jeremy, that's that's exactly the point. Like, there's so many different ways to spoof that now. You you there and, and organizationally, it's difficult. This even gets back to Jordan's you know earlier comment on governance. Nobody wants to sit down and look at policy. <laughs> and, you know, it's not something most people get up in the morning and go, man, I cannot wait to pile into this thousand pages of documentation and try to tie each one of these things back to common measures or common risk. It, it just isn't sexy or exciting. But to some degree, you, you know, you mentioned the systemic uh, hacking that's going on. You know, maybe there's a necessitation to, to have some degree of scrubbing and and take a look at your governance procedures. And from that, distill that down into something meaningful that you can use to meet 
the guidelines and the and the compliance requirements that an organization has. And in most cases, those requirements are built around what are you doing to stop the risk from manifesting? And then once it manifests, you know, you've got your incident response and you've got all the stuff that you do in, in relation to that. But but there's no, you almost can't do that anymore. I mean, by the time it, it in a in a typical, I think. I think PwC or Deloitte published a thing one time that a typical, and this is a few years ago, typically when a breach is found by an auditor, it's been alive in your system for 261 days. Yeah. Well, that's, yep. that's a eternity IBM. today. I mean, that's like space travel eternity. Like we can get to Mars in 261 days. And if somebody's got free reign of your infrastructure and your technical stack or has your IP, that that's, that's more time than they need. They, well, that's, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened in the Solar Winds hack. They were, nine they months, had nine months, solar months, months, months and months inside of all these organizations to do anything they wanted, and they yep. did what they and what they did isn't necessarily in that nine months um, make it obvious that they were there. They planted other things for future use that no one's heard of, no one's discovered yet, mm -hmm. right? They, they've, they've, they've inserted blocks into code, right? You know, it's like, how do you trust? How do you trust anything now from SolarWinds? Because you're going right? to you trust on any... RSA. They're going to keynote on RSA and they're going to tell you why they, you're going to trust them. Uh, and their password is going to be SolarWinds 2021. Yeah, there you yeah, go. So, <laughs> so, well, so Dave, I, I was going to follow up on what Jeremy said earlier, and, and I, I find some irony in the fact that if you go out and try to hire an employee today, I believe mm -hmm. you have to verify their credentials. You have yeah. to do a background check on them, right? And you've got to have all this information that certifies who they are is who they are. You get a yep. driver's business passport. Yeah, I know. So, so but, but, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I'll think about that in the context of vaccination records. The vaccination record that you get, and I just went through this with one of my kids, is still the same paper card that was probably issued when polio hit. They have a problem they with that. Knew. Somebody's <laughs> making fake COVID-19 vaccinations that are identical to... The, the ones it's Virginia not Virginia. rocket science. I mean, you can go out, the CDC built guidelines for electronic <laughs> records of vaccinations back in 2009. You can get a QR code from the CDC and it can, it, 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 it's not a difficult spoof. I, I think in terms of your, you know, Kevin Mitnick level spoofing that, that this is at a level now that's sort of sub kindergarten, maybe pre-K. And, and the same thing, Al, with, with you think about the process of getting hired, typically you go into HR, you hand them your driver's license, you have your paper social security card that was issued and probably turning to dust in my case. Yeah, and you hand team. those, yeah, you, 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 hand, you still have to hand those things to somebody and they make a copy of it and that copy resides somewhere. And if you're really lucky, they go in and they make copies of the copy to digitize them and they're uploaded somewhere. And then somebody has to do a workaround because they couldn't upload to the new technology. So there's an Excel sheet. And then that eventually gets onto work day. But, but the detritus of that process creates so much opportunity to create other types of identification. So a lot of this just gets back to, it, it's sort of like my earlier comment, you know, we focus on the bright, shiny objects, but there's also a degree of we need to point the new technology at protection of the most important assets and and those are background checks even you know and and and, and, and even the background check hasn't changed drastically it's kind of the same thing and you pick a menu and you know it's it's not a difficult process to spoof now once you start getting into government that that's a little bit more complex but who knows what's happened with that at, at now that you know the solar one tech so yeah, and, and the other thing i think it's important too is that we often miss the opportunity to talk about 
that if you have these controls, this risk management, the governance, right, and the cybersecurity at a level that's healthy, you get to go out and use that in the marketplace to differentiate yourself and potentially grow your client base. Exactly. That's exactly it. And and to, to a large degree, a lot of this is just deferred maintenance. You know, uh, we had a rough year this year. We couldn't make the investment in technology or we, you know, these or or we outsource that. So, you know, it's not our problem anymore, except for the warehouse of records that are, you know, paper and the upload that somebody did at one point to, you know, some type of share drive. All of the all of those factors um, make make the issue so complex that I guess my, in my opinion, you almost just have to start over. And, and that starting over is different than enforcing password complexity. It's, it's a more, it's a more pragmatic approach than these, these structures and these controls that originally kind of came out of the committee of sponsoring organizations and then just got, you know, risk audit, compliance and you know you have the framework that's yeehaw that's great if your organization uses two different frameworks you've got two different views of risk I, I can almost guarantee it and and if you have two of anything you just made it less secure I, that's just i mean it's it's a it, it it's become a complex issue mainly because people became comfortable with what they knew which in my case was Windows NT. So I'm pretty outdated, uh, <laughs> but, but I'm a whiz at NT. So uh, I'm from the day of IBM OS 2. So I, I go, I go. <laughs> I'm so glad to meet somebody else that remembers that. I wasted like a year trying to programming on that. And then Microsoft <laughs> popped up. It's like, well, that was a waste of time. Well, I could date myself back a little bit further to the IBM 3, 360 series of, of mainframes, Ooh. but I'll, I'll, I'll be careful there too. But, <laughs> so I, I'm curious, Dave, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to dominate some of this conversation because mm. I'd like to hear more from Jeremy and Chris, but one final question I'll have for the moment. Talk to me about, as you look at cybersecurity risk in a company, and you mentioned earlier, there's all these other areas of risk that a business has to look at. What are the top two that need to be considered in addition to cybersecurity as an overlapping risk that would have dependencies on cybersecurity for a company? Hmm. I, I'm struggling a little on that, Al, because I think all, all of the entire organization is ultimately a cyber risk. And that's where I kind of go back to this idea of like, we've got to stop putting the cyber people in a corner. And, and, and that doesn't mean that every decision, because I, I know Chris and I have seen this where you end up, you know, with your cybersecurity department running your organization because they're looking at everything and monitoring. You know, the minute you have a human being touch it, it just sort of fragments. So the, the, the part of that's, you know, kind of a technical type's fault is, is we can find risk in almost anything. But I think that cybersecurity risk expands in a couple of different areas. First, your first entry point is always going to be your technology. And, and when you customize, when you move to the cloud, when you start daisy chaining things together because nobody wants to give up the mainframe, but you need a mobile app for your customers, that's a business decision that's going to compound your risk ultimately. And so I think I think the first place to look really goes down to that that third party risk issue, that third party and fourth party risk. And if you have opportunity, maybe it's time to pull some of those things back in. You know, it, 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 it's, it's understanding third party. And then I think it's understanding in relation to what your business is doing. It, it's, it's less of a, it's a strategic business issue. And I'll give you an example that I mentioned going to the K earlier. So you pull a company's 10K and their annual report, they will include a section called risk factors. I can't tell you the number of times people, in, when I say, hey, you have a risk factor noted here uh, about your protection of data and your potential um, exposure to various uh, international privacy requirements. 
uh, it's in your 10K. What's the 10K? Well, it's the report your company issues. Well, we don't we don't need to look at that. That's your public facing document that's <laughs> telling every investor, and, and it's a rote paragraph now. There's usually three paragraphs related to technology or three risk factors related to technology, and they are somehow going to cover your consumer risk, your business continuity risk, your susceptibility to unforeseen events, all of these things. So your, your value that you're getting from that K, you can't tie your publicly facing risk disclosure to an actual risk in your business. Like that, that to me is just, that's the first step. You're, you're submitting a document to your shareholders, articulating the fact that you have risk in an area and you're not able to show directly how that translates back to the business. Yeah, we, we recently uh, met with a company that, that we ultimately won together uh, with, with Jeremy, but the, the CIO was shocked that we took the time to go look at that K document and come back <laughs> and repeat to them what was in there in terms of their cybersecurity risk. And he said, exactly. I'm shocked, right? And, and I think yeah. more people need to pay attention to that from a public company aspect from anything from shopping at them sometimes to doing any kind of business with them or whatever. Yep. It's, it's, a, it's a very straightforward way to tie back technical, I'll, I'll, I'll use the broad term, but it is, it is ultimately security, to tie technical risk back to your organization's publicly facing statements. And, and I think the challenge there becomes, the, the sheer volume of breaches and disclose, you know, this, this, all of these disclosures in spite of this just show ultimately a, a organization's unwillingness or inability to kind of peel back to the core a little bit and make a decision around why are we saying this? What's, what's the point of saying this and how do we tie this back to our actual, uh, regulatory requirements and frameworks. That, yeah, that I think it, it definitely exposes them to a liability if they have now publicly stated and they haven't done anything. So Chris, uh, jump in, please. <laughs> well, I have to first tell you that when you switch to a regular beer versus the locale one, you can tell. All right, just let me know. No. <laughs> um, so, so the next, so Dave, I mean, I got two things in my head. One is, is like if we were doing a sound bite, and I was kind of late. You haven't been drinking at all, Dave. You've just been chattering. Um, I'm, I'm down one angry Scotsman. And that's I'm down and one angry Scotsman. Starting, starting, starting on some vocal fry. <laughs> so, so the, the, the kind of the clip I wanted you to go through is, because you mentioned it, like you went, you went down a road and you came back, went down a road. Governance. If, if you yeah. were to start a governance program today, not a SOC, not a security program, a governance program today. There's companies that just don't have one. So if you're going to start one, what would be your advice and what would be your, like your one, two, three step that you'd tell people to do? I think the first step in any governance process, especially as it relates to risk, is seeing how many different ways your organization talks about risk. Because if everybody's a snowflake inside the walls of your organization and they've all got their own risk profiles and their special risk, you're, you're kind of dead at the starting line. That's just, that's, that is a, that is a non-starter. So consolidating your risk, your control frameworks, looking at the control frameworks from a meaning standpoint. And, you know, there's a fairly common phrase around, you know, do it, do one test, apply to many. So how are you compiling that, that, that information and acting on that information once you've gathered where your risks are? And I, I think a large degree, it's gonna, it forces a lens back on why are we doing certain activities? Let's go through our, you know, if the only reason we have a control in place is for Sarbanes-Oxley, that's great, but it's probably not really focused on your other as the other aspects of your business. And I see that a lot, you know, where, where, oh, this part of the business doesn't report 
to it, this is a finance this isn't a systemic financial institution or this would never rise to the level of a, a material deficiency well then why you have it as a control you know i, I mean it, it, it and i think those from a governance governance standpoint we've been we've i mean i'm using the collective but in a lot of cases it's the governance that has just kind of gone willy-nilly you know right, so and completely you let me paraphrase you. So you're saying, listen, if you're going to start a, a governance program today, it's okay. You say, hey, these are the requirements or regulations that my my yeah. company is, is held to. But the first thing I, that you really should do is listen across your company and find out what are they worried about? Because what they're worried about is probably what your biggest risk is. And then yeah. organize it. Okay. So the next and, one... And I was going to add to that, Chris. That's where you really need to go and talk to your security people because I guarantee your security people are seeing things. I mean, just just within fluency, you know, you sort of sit there like, man, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in this organization. It's it's not rocket science, but to a certain degree, and I think Jeremy Jeremy's points right on with that. We've got this whole different scenario now where people are just laying these, these, I think the term is eggs for the type of exploit, and then they're just selling the eggs. And, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the world of script kitties gone horribly awry. So horribly wrong. You, know, you, you got to go back and look at your governance and say, okay, are we really doing this? Is the pen test that we have to run every year actually doing anything? Is 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 that really a control, or are we just checking boxes? So, so, so the simplification to measurement, right? Yeah. And, then, and, and and so, you know, you said risk. I think we we if you this is a drinking game, none of us would even be alive if we were drinking out the word risk. Oh risk. God, no. <laughs> so so so. Let me can I can I interject for one second? Yeah. Um, there's about to be a violin lesson in my background, so we're going to need to pause. I need to relocate rooms, and I'll be right back. Okay, you can pause. Okay. Oh, you know what? This is a good time to pause. I'm, I'm, I'm almost down on this beer, and, and I'm going to really, well, I'll, we can do a beer swap. So we'll do a timeout, and okay. we'll do a beer swap, and but we're going to keep rolling, and then somebody's going to chop, chop. All right? I'm mute because I don't want to start singing God Save the Queen. And have, you know, <laughs> God Save the Queen is an excellent song. <laughs> I'm going to get another beer. Look, you're good. Thank you. Um. At least I'm wearing pants today. I think I might even go get me a second beer. What? I'm telling you, dude. It's one of those days, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it actually is. <laughs> oh, we got thunderstorms setting my way, too. I'll be right back. Pants requirement. That's another valuable lesson. Not yeah. That's personal, one thing. But... <laughs> <laughs> if we've learned anything from the pandemic. The people wear pants. pants. <laughs> and 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 just for purposes, one of the other people on this call, not pajama pants. Those are not real pants. I know. <laughs> Uh, 
So there we go. We're gonna really throw people off. Probably only need like 10 minutes. Yeah, it's okay. We'll do the chop we'll, we'll, and we put it back together again. It's kind of humpty dumpty it. What does it but, say differ? Net wars D F I R. Digital oh. forensics incident response. That's cool. My uh we were at a SANS conference and uh, the group I was working with, we won one of the Net Wars tournaments. Nice. Cool. Someone, someone, bre someone breached and we were like, ah, we found you. Well, say so actually, so that's a, I think that's an interesting way to think about this, Jeremy. Like, what do y'all see? What, are, what risk are companies not doing? What, okay. where, where is the hole? Ready? Emily, we're coming back. Uh, and and Al's got his, Al got a second beer. We're, we're only going to probably go 10 more minutes, right? So emergency. Wait, wait, wait. So Jeremy got a third beer. <laughs> Weekend vibes, <laughs> IPA. <laughs> All right. Weekend vibes. Okay. Okay, I'm coming with the Honor Brewery uh, uh, Maple Porter. Um, not exactly one of my more favorite style of beers, but uh, it's better than a sour. And, and Dave was going to bring a sour. He was going to be the first person with a sour on the show. I've got uh, so I've got a prairie artisan ales. Uh, nice rainbow sherbet. No, oh. I'm sure that's going to be horrible. And then we're gonna... I've got a Belgian a Belgian wit beer from uh, Stone Cloud Brewing called uh, Neon Sunshine. He's going to also gonna uh, chase his chase his other beer with it. <laughs> you need to have one of those hats. Also be, uh, Oh, the, you one of those hats with the helmets and you get some straws you can try one of each. This could be an illuminating experience. Okay, Al, Al, this is a breakthrough. Beer two. An actual beer two from you. What is beer two gonna be? Well, it, it's it's the it's Alaskan, but it's their icy bay IPA at uh, six point two percent. Yeah, we gotta let Ooh, that nice. product, you know, get, get that product placement in because Al always drinks the Alaskans. I think he brought a case of this stuff. And you buy a case of it at Costco, but to, you got to use it up, right? And I save it for these shows. All right, so I Dave, think, that you're better than the King Cobra. <laughs> yeah. So, so Emily, Emily, we're gonna restart. Right, we're right already now. restarted. Which now she can have the choppy interruption of restarting. We're yeah, really, yeah. You're ending. Okay. So Dave. Um, you know, again, we, we talked about risk. I asked you, hey, you know what, what would a person do to get governance going? You said, you know, take a list. So one of the things is, is, you know, in the NSA, the risk is defined as you have an intersection of three things, a technical vulnerability, an opportunity, right? When that vulnerability is actually exploitable or how it is, right? And, a threat, somebody who's willing to, to take advantage of that opportunity versus that, that vulnerability. And that's, that's the definition of risk, right? Mathematically yeah. speaking, right? And to mitigate it, what we try to do is push one or all three of them away from the intersection, right? So we try to remove the threat, if we can, remove the opportunity, which is very common, or remove the technology. That's the reason why like threat patching, you know, patching became so big, right? Yeah. I remember the technical, but you know, you can't find all your bugs. You still have to get rid of opportunity and, and you do bizarrely have to get rid of threat. Um, so one of the ways to get rid of threat, of course, is make it so that there's nothing for them to steal. They won't really want to be there. Um, so, so as you go down that in governance and you look at mitigation, you, you have bizarrely speaking, government's requirement oriented. So how do you balance pure risk analysis and risk mathematics versus the checkbox world of cyber and Oxley or whatever and, and, and PETA and, and GDPR and NIST and the checkbox world where there is no understanding of actually what risk is, there is a do or don't do kind of Yoda thing. Well, I think part of that comes down to your, your it's just your awareness of what you're trying to protect what's so important if it's records then you have ponemon institute it comes out every year with a really handy number that says this is the average cost of breach 
You take that by your number of records, multiply it, ta-da, there's your exposure. Like it's, it's, it's that, and, and, and there's a lot of smart people that are, are way smarter than I am with regards to this. I just personally like to chop this stuff up into kind of Barney style chunks where I can, I can explain it in a- yeah, Does that work, a, this quantification of risk saying, listen guys, this is an eight, you know, this is a, this is a 10% chance and we're talking about an $8 million damage Therefore, really, you should be really looking at, on average, you're going to lose $800,000. So what's wrong with spending $50,000 to fix this problem? Does that really work? In yeah. the well, it does. I mean, that's, that's kind of the current approach. But, but I think you're, I, I, there's, there's an inter intersection here that I think is kind of interesting with this. When you think about like that N NSA triangle and that threat removal and those things, has the, has the cheese moved? Is that now as viable an approach because in a lot of cases I, i'll use like the teams exploit that just came out for microsoft teams where you know it's just a jpeg you're inserting in a chat and it looks feels walks talks like the organization your chance of getting that is going to depend on that behavior changing you know that that rule change and then and so when you start talking in terms of why is this a risk to me and my organization? And maybe that's a number of factors. Maybe it's I've got IP, I've got routing numbers, I've got, I've got critical information I want to protect. And then I've got employee information and I've got customer information, blah, blah, blah. So you got all this information that you want to protect and then put that in the context of why you're protecting it. What's the threat? How, how could this potentially manifest itself? But that's the problem with these control-based solutions that focus on segregation of security and technology into these separate bu uh, buckets. It, it's all homo homogenized now. It's all in the mix. It's the same, the same type of risk. And so I think organizations have to start thinking about, I don't want to detect it. I want to be able to see it coming. I want to be able to see when something is out of the norm. And so if you think about transaction volume as a good account right now. So, I mean, there's trillions of transactions a day. If you're still using a sample based audit approach to try to find an issue with how you're looking for exploits, vulnerabilities, whatever in that stack, you're fishing with dynamite. If you get something on a sample of 30, you're lucky. It has nothing to do with the quality of the control or the risk. You're just, you're going through the motion of saying, I've reviewed this. It's a daily sample. I've done it 30 times. Here's the output. Knock yourself out. You're not, okay, you're not just, talking. You said something crazy. And, and I think that we need to talk about the crazy talk. Um, fishing with dynamite. Okay. So, fishing with dynamite. So crazy in the South. Um, no, I mean, I think you said something crazy, but it's, it's crazy smart, which is to say, listen, we have all these ways we used to do things. Sampling yeah. is a great example, right? And yet, with the big data world we have today, like we, we, we have a client who's not that big. We're talking sub 10,000 users with 500 million events a day to be analyzed. 500 million events a day yeah. for 10,000 people. Sampling is not going to do much, right? Won't work. So, so where, where is the hope in the technology? Like, are you seeing changes? Are you seeing anything successful of, of the new approaches on how to find risk? Besides not, energy. Not really. I mean, again, I don't spend my days looking at this, you know, trying to find this stuff. I usually rely on you or somebody else that's more seeing this real time to tell me, hey, this is kind of a thing. You might want to start paying attention to it. Um, and, and that's where I think there's a real canary in the coal mine aspect yeah. for a lot of these organizations that have frontline people looking at traffic, looking at patterns, looking at behavior. And you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm deviating as I want to do, but there's been a lot of effort spent, I'd say within the last few years on digital transformation of organizations. 
In a lot of cases, that's Tableau. Somebody's built a dashboard that reports the same thing that you've been doing the same way for the last X number of years. It's got to be manually updated. Does it show a risk manifesting? Yeah, but that risk is manifesting potentially in, in three, six months in arrears. And, and, and it's, it just takes a different, you got to kind of switch the lens to some degree. Those those traditional models of password complexity and you know making sure that you're going through proper change control, you throw in SaaS solutions and cloud and, and all of these other mobile technologies, you're just exacerbating the problem. And so 500 million events for a small company would have been unheard of the, 10 years ago. I think, I think the latest ISACA standards maybe came out in 2014. And, and technology has materially changed over the last five years. Well, oh, God, it, it, will, even, it will, yeah. But, but German and I can attest, I mean, we're using Sentinel One with their, with their cloud funnel, and it's generating gig of data per user, like gig of data per user per day, right? I mean, this is, these are, listen, the data is awesome. Let's just be on the other side of the coin. If there's a problem, you can find something in the answers, right? That's phone yeah. number one. Oh, like completely. That. But, but the amount of data, unless you're, of course you're using Office 365, the amount of data you're getting is incredible, right? Yeah. Um, the, 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 the SaaS vendors, I'm not joking, the SaaS vendors are very light. And you, Zoom doesn't even tell you the IP address that the person is logging in from or the telephone number they're supposedly using voice. They're, they're, it's, it's not even in the Zoom audit. They tell so, you the time zone. Yeah, and somebody just got two hundred thousand dollars from that pond event, right? Where they broke into Zoom or something like that, right? So, yeah. so Dave, let me let me ask you kind of a reverse: is when you identify the different risks from a business perspective, right? I think oftentimes those can be translated back into a tool like Fluency with the behavioral patterns or exactly. rules in place, right? That's number one. And then two, come in kind of from a policy perspective and say, now I'm going to inspect what I expect. So now I got the rules watching for the risk and I'm ensuring that I've got from a policy perspective, those risks uh, identified and, and being adhered to. Yeah, we try to, uh, yeah. you know, in these podcasts, Dave, we kind of try to avoid talking about our companies, but I, I think Al's point is very good, right? So really what Al is saying is, is that, listen, you can't see everything, right? So right, right now, we, you have to understand the checks box, check boxes. See, I'm, I'm, it's beginning to hit now. Now that I upgra upgraded, the check boxes are gonna eventually fail you, right? Because yeah. it, 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 it's, it can't see it. But, but the point from Al's perspective is, is if behavior deviates, there has to be a reason That's, why it deviated, especially if it deviated on a privileged account, you should review it, right? Even if it's wrong half the time, <laughs> that you, you should- Where's your it. risk? Just, just right. add, how, how do you, how do you, I think that- Yeah, Jeremy, go on. I was, how do you deal with the friction between IT risk and business risk, ah. and the bit that's the that that's the thing that we see the most, that we struggle with the most is that, as a as a managed service provider, managed security services provider, we're coming in and saying you have all these problems that you need to address. Let's build a plan. Let's take them off one by one. And on the other side of the fence, you have them saying, but if I do that, there's going to be impact to my business. They don't want 2FA because that's inconvenient. They don't want tap cards because that's inconvenient. They don't want this or that, or it's going to impact the customer workflow. How yeah. do you how do you deal with that friction? Well, I, that's actually Jeremy. I think that's the that's the elephant in the room to over, use an overused phrase, and and I think that's where, at some degree, and some level, the responsible parties for oversight, which are, you know, is the board of directors in a publicly traded company, are the, are the officers in a public traded company need to knowingly 
sign off on that risk. And that's where I think you see there's a lot of dilutions um, that occur from, you know, you, you think of the early example, something pops on Splunk, your analyst sees it, he takes it to his boss, his boss takes it to his boss. It, it winds its way through the organization, but ultimately probably gets stomped on because sales are, are, are the ultimate driver. And, and, and I'm not saying you have to discount sales as the ultimate driver, but you need to make a conscious decision around, I'm accepting this risk. You know, use the, you know, like the Java patch thing. Is it, is it worth, you know, if you've got to unpatch Java, everybody's got to unpatch Java. Where's, where is it? What's it doing? Is it, is it important enough to rise to the board level? Or is it something that could be mitigated relatively easily? But I think I think part of the, the systemic issue here, Dave, is I'm reminded of my military days. By the time yeah. that uh, an enlisted person says something and catches it, and by the time it gets to the colonel, you the colonel doesn't want to hear about this problem, so you water that down, and it's not a real problem to get there. And I'm thinking the same thing applies to the corporate world, right? It does. And, and, and Jeremy's point is spot. I mean, that's 100%. Jeremy's 10 times out of 10. What Jeremy's describing is exactly what happens. We need a more frictionless experience for our, our customer. So, yeah, I know this is kind of a risk, but we really, really need to stop enforcing these complex passcodes because nobody follows them. And then, you know, well, the outcome is you might lose your data, but that decision never gets elevated out to that point. I mean, so it, do you it, think that it, the we, we see a high turnover rate with CISOs? Do you think that <laughs> yeah. part of that is because that they're not being listened to? No, they're yeah. getting better money elsewhere. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, but Chris, this is exactly the point I think you were, you were trying to make earlier, where the first thing I look at if I'm looking at, at a CISO in an organization is what's their reporting structure? Where do they report? If they report to the CIO, yeah. there's a reasonable chance they're only doing that because that shifts their budget to other budgets and you can you can pick on it. There's there sometimes they sit outside of risk and have a direct reporting uh, relationship with the board, which is good, but that's usually not what happens. So the CISO role is 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 I think one of the most complex roles in corporate America right now because you're trying to juggle dynamite and or nitroglycerin and and uh and, and keep all these balls in the air while the business is actively adding complexity and risk to the model because they want to outsource or they want to add new functionality. And it just exacerbates the issue. And yeah. that, that transparency, if you look at the, uh, the Office of the Com Comptroller of the Currency's findings for 2020 and what they found for systemic risk within organizations, almost all of it relates at some level or another to technology and data risk and and failure to really articulate that. And and the funny thing to me, I saw a blurb on this earlier today, was this idea of, you know, well, we're going to take all of our data and put it in a giant data lake. Yay. You just made it super easy for <laughs> me to exploit the areas that you've already probably got governance issues in. And you may and you now, may or may not be able to use 20% of that data. Right. It, 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 it may, it's as good as it is the day that, that you know, the policy's finalized and, and then it probably gets bastardized to some level. Uh, I mean, it just, but, but Jeremy is spot on and I, it, it, this idea of businesses just have to understand you can't separate these things anymore. It would, it would be like a bank that accepted deposits coming out and saying, you know, well, we're just going to leave the safe open because you know our customers want to have access and we're not going to really you know do much to protect the safe we'll get this this security guard with a gun and they'll hang out and watch the door but you know we're willing to take that risk because we want our customers to have access to their stuff and we've turned into the George Carlin example Chris and I were talking about this of like we get stuff and then we get bigger <laughs> things to hold our stuff. And then we get more stuff. And we keep on amassing stuff without ever dealing with the front end problem of 
was the stuff you started with really high quality? And if it was, why did you keep on collecting it? <laughs> like it's, it's, it's there's there's a lot of practical knowledge in comedy. That <laughs> yeah. So hey, Dave, you know, one last thing because we keep on going. You and I can keep talking. Is when you look at everything we've talked about, we've looked a lot at the sense of the negative part. That here's business and security. I have to give you some bad news, right? You actually have to do something in a more secure manner, right? Um, do you think one of the issues with our CISO position is that because they don't comprehend business, they can't articulate the business benefits of security? And I mean, in a sense that, listen, what's awesome about security is, is like, I, I remember much talking about um, IoT. And he said, you know, the yeah. IoT, it's not, it's not surfing the ESPNs and the latest scores. It doesn't want to know where 90210 is today, <laughs> right? But I always keep the same damn thing very consistently with very little risk. And the result of IoT is very, it's, it's that, it's efficiency, right? It, yeah. it, that if I, if I block ESPN and I block CNN and Fox News, I just block freaking news. And I say, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I, if I start solidifying better security, my people would be more efficient, right? Oh, yeah. And so I was wondering, do you think it's because the CISOs we have are too geeky? We all came up as technical people, not business people. Jeremy's going, no, fuck no, Chris. No, 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 no. I need my 90210 where they are now. Some of them are good looking. <laughs> no, what, what were you going to say, Jeremy? What, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, I, I'm still mourning I, with I, Perry's loss. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody brought up a Talladega Nights reference about, uh, you know, conservative in the front party in the back. You know, that, yeah. that poor boy committed suicide, um, the older brother, right? I mean, it's really sad. He was, he was a veteran, too. I mean, and you have to look at that, what, what serving can do to somebody's head. Yeah. Yeah. You got to take care of each other. So, um, Jeremy, Jeremy, you were going to say? I think nice. Yeah. I think I think what I've in my observations has been that CISOs intend to do the right thing. They want to do the right thing, but they're hamstrung. They're hamstrung because the business says no. The purse, the person who controls the purse strings says there's no money for that. Right? They the the business doesn't want to accept risk doesn't want to accept IT risk as part as actual business risk. They, when they think of business risk, they're thinking of competitor, product obsolescence, they're thinking of those types of things. And they're not looking at and they're not looking at IT as a business risk yet. And I think if anything that's happened since probably before the pandemic, we saw this uptick in ransomware. During the pandemic, ransomware went up what 400 and something percent. I, I saw a statistic the from breach, one of the breach number last year equaled the 15 years prior. The amount of money lost due to security issues. And, and, and Jeremy, actually, you bring up a very excellent point. So what you're saying is, hey, Chris, you know, get a sediment, relax. Here's the reality. The reality is, is that there is no return on investment for security, right? That the stupidest thing someone ever said in the late 90s, early 2000s, was try to determine return on investment in your security. The reality is security is security, right? It's a cost center. It's a loss. You're, you're, you're well, going it's, to it's, lose in order not to get effed. I, I, I agree with that as a product. It's, that's a, it's, a, it's not necessarily a profit center on the surface. But if, if IT is the enabler, to drive your business and to drive your product, right? Then you have to look at securing IT as part of the cost of doing business, right? And I think for the, the, the thousands of companies who've been hit with ransomware in this past 12 to 18 months, mm -hmm. and, and all of us who've been breached because Zuckerberg thinks it's our fault that Facebook got breached, not his. He has no culpability whatsoever in that, Right. 
a fat guy. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah. the, that IT, IT has to be, you have to invest in IT security the same way you invest in marketing, the same way you invest in your sales, the same way you invest in product development. As a, as a 2021 and beyond company, if you're not doing that, if you're not looking at IT security as a business enabler, then you're, you're going to fail. Right. Period. Now, so, so, so to kind of paraphrase that, Jeremy, because we did a lot of writing on our side about how security relates to business growth, right? And people say it all the time. Like, if you don't have a good network infrastructure, you get more customers, you can't grow. And, and what you're saying is really spot on the money with what our research showed, which is that, listen, if you don't have your act together on security, you can't grow. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not, you can't be efficient. You can't Flat out. Yeah. So, so listen, guys, we're, we're, we've, we're, we've been taking this. I just want to say one thing. We've been taking this a little bit farther. We believe that, that, information security travels beyond the borders of your firewall. Information oh, yeah. security is your public persona. It is what other people are saying about you. It's fighting the disinformation that's coming at your company by your competitors, by people who just are assholes and hate you or whatever it is, right? We've actually put together a disinformation product where we have a team of people who goes through and is just like you're, th it's just like you think about marketing. For every for every positive thing you want to put out there, someone's going to counteract that with a negative thing. So this our disinformation service is fighting that negative that negativity, fighting that brand dilution, or fighting that that fear, uncertainty, and doubt that others are trying to spin about your product or your company or your solution. Yeah, so there's a lot of that. And, and, and so, so let's, Dave, it's, it, it, he's trying to end it. So can you bring us out with him 267 from the back of the hymn book? Can you tell us <laughs> what is it that you would like to say, you know, as a closing remark to the life of Dave and, and risk? Well, I was going to ask uh, him one, one additional question if I could. We're done. We're done. That was, that was the last one I asked. No, no, but, I got one more going here. <laughs> so, so Dave, in, in my personal opinion, since the pandemic mm -hmm. began and the, the borders of the corporate perimeter firewall just melted away. I think mm -hmm. through 2020 and probably even in 21, that the singular highest risk to a business is the personal behavior patterns of employees at their homes, invading into and through the use of corporate <laughs> assets uh, and, and VPNs and all that other stuff. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. And I think, I think to Jeremy's point around the CISOs, w one pattern that I do see in that space a lot is people hire a position to fix a broader problem. Oh, we'll get a new CISO and that'll fix all of the flotsam and jetsam that we have <laughs> back here on the technology stack. Oh, yes, it's, sir, man. It's, <laughs> it's that that yeah essentially just you know sort of hey we need a new guy to kick around or girl or you know we're just going to bring this this person in and that's going to be they're just going to be the latest to you know sit on the keg of dynamite and uh you know hopefully they're not on it when it blows but i think that you just it, it the, the risk requires a different thought process and a different approach <laughs> And I am a hundred percent agreement with Jeremy. It's it's your business, period. There, there's not a way to separate this risk anymore. And the longer we continue to insist on doing that, the the broader the problem becomes. And and frankly, the speed and uh, nature of these exploits is going to continue to accelerate. So it it's a lot. A lot of this gets back to organizationally, what are you trying to do? And figure that out and then secure it appropriately. You know, I think to your point, Dave, the hackers, the bad people, whatever you want to call them, the APT groups. Adversaries. The adversaries, right? They're spending more on R&D than we are. 
Exactly. They're <laughs> they're they're making they're making billions of dollars. Yep. In money, and they're hiring armies of programmers to sit there and comb code, find holes, and write exploits. And we, yep. as defenders, need to be able to do. We need to be we need to be doing the same thing. Whether you're a defender for your organization as an individual or a defender for an or many organizations like like Fluency and Fortify are, right? Or or Verify, right? Yeah. We have to put the same amount of effort into R and D and to make sure that we're delivering a secure service in order to combat these upcoming threats. And the Easter yeah. eggs, we just have to we just have to put advanced detection in place to so that when those easter eggs are found or are activated that we have some sort of, of alerting system whether that's through a deception technology like a tivo has or or another ransomware prevention technology like uh from another gentleman we had on the show a few episodes ago. yeah i think that's spot on jeremy it's it's all about spotting and reacting endpoint detection and response the response part's the important part, but you got to detect it before you can respond to it. So, yeah, and, and the tough all, part, right, is yeah. is this, and I'll tie it all back to behaviors. Is that you, you can't rely on on scripts, you can't rely on lists, you can't rely on checkbox, you can't rely on that stuff. And today, it really is all about these patterns of behavior that are not normal, right? Watching what is happening in real time as it's happening and being able to deduce, you have a risk. Yep. And to Jeremy's point, the people that are, this is a business now. It is an industry. They are, and, and they, they're constantly looking for these exploits. And unfortunately, we've had a few big ones that have uh, exposed the uh, soft underbelly of, of, of these organizations that use these products. And it, it's, it's time to start taking this seriously again. Right. You know, if, you know, back to so, 1997. <laughs> well, good. At least we didn't go back further in, in my past. Well, that's good. Uh, so listen, uh, Dave. Prehistoric. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> Prehistoric. Oh, thank you all. I enjoyed thank this. you so I'm much. Uh, we really appreciate the insights and, and, and things. And we really encourage our listeners to go take a look at uh, Verify and, and see what you're, they're about as well. So with that, uh, any final thoughts, Jeremy and Chris? Three beers in, I'm ready to keep going. <laughs> yeah.